If you're excited about Jesus Christ, let me hear you say, hey, praise God, amen. We're a Christ-centered organization, and we want to see lives change. And we know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is where life change happens. Reaching the hard to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to see you raise your kids in the church house and not the dope house. Amen. We're in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 through 22. If not the most difficult, one of the most difficult scripture passages I've ever had to preach through in my entire ministry. Just so you know. This is, this is not an easy passage. Um, but it's simple once you understand it, once you study it. But at first it's a monster. But I refuse to avoid it. I promise to preach through Peter verse by verse. And I'm preaching through Peter verse by verse. And this is, this is in the book of Peter. And so 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. By, uh, and then it says, verse 20. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20. For whom, whom formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls were saved through water, there is also an anti-type. Very important you get that word. Anti-type, which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh. Basically, he's saying, I'm not talking about going down in the water. But an answer of a good conscience towards God. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 22. Who has gone into the heavens and is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities, powers having been made subject to him. Peter is teaching a group of people. He's writing a letter to the persecuted church. These people are being persecuted physically, verbally, socially. They don't have a whole lot to be thankful for. They don't have a whole lot of, I mean, physically, materially, right? Um, if you've been here for very long at all, you do know the, the theme of Peter by now. The first Peter's theme is being so focused on the hope to come that no matter what happens in this present life, it will not drag you down. Being so focused on eternal uh, eternal incorruptible things that temporary corruptible things do not stop you from following God and so through the text these people were slandered persecuted under pressure from society he's teaching them how to live in a hostile world Peter is teaching them about the culture that's against faith in Christ they're suffering now two weeks ago when we started this this section, I told you that we would be in, the, in a section that dealt a lot with suffering. Suffering like Jesus. The path of suffering. The title of, this, of the sermon is this. Like Jesus, like Noah. Like Jesus, like Noah. As a Christian, the focal point of this message is to walk like Jesus walked in his example. Peter teaches those that read this letter, he's teaching them to have confidence in God. He's teaching them not to fear men. He's teaching them to look to their inheritance. When it comes to suffering, do you feel like God is absent from you as a Christian? Sometimes you feel like you're doing everything right, right? You're checking the box. I'm giving, I'm serving, I'm loving, I'm, I'm preparing, I'm reading, I'm, I'm being faithful to my family, I'm being faithful to my wife, and why is this happening to me? I mean, that happens, amen, that happens, doesn't it? And, and, and in those times, many times we feel like God is so far from us and God is away from us. But listen to me, friend. God is not far from you any time because God's word says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God is involved. God is present. God is active right in the middle of your life, even and especially when you're suffering for his glory. But the ideas of this world has, have infiltrated the gospel of Jesus Christ. The ideas have fooled many people. 
to come to this mentality that there is no crown. There, there, there is a crown without a cross. That there is an easy path. David Livingston, one of the greatest missionaries of old, was in Africa. They wrote David Livingston a letter back when they didn't have internet or anything like that. And, and David Livingston, they said, is there, a, is there an easier route to Africa? David Livingston said, if you're looking for an easy route to Africa, do not come. There is no easy route. I would tell you tonight that if you're looking for an easy route through Christianity, do not come. There is no easy route. The Bible says, pick up your cross and follow me or you are not worthy of me. That is a pretty simple statement that needs no interpretation. See, that's the gospel. What did Jesus say? John 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, no, it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you because it, it loves its own. But because you're not of the world, I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember, Jesus says, John 15, verse 20. If you're taking notes, remember the word I said to you. A servant, a follower of Christ, is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep your word. But all these things they will do to you on my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. That's the gospel. That's the, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of you are listening to the sound of my voice, and you're saying, Preacher, since I got saved, my friends have turned on me. My family wants nothing to do with me. My co-workers do not like me. People do not want to be around me that I've known my whole entire life because I've accepted Christ as my Savior. I say to that statement, remember the example that we have to follow in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are a Christian soldier. Walk the walk. Talk the talk. Do not back down. Can I remind you, friend, that you are called to be a witness, to pick up your cross, and follow after Jesus Christ. You will be rejected, I promise. You will be persecuted, I promise. You will have people lie on you, slander you, talk about you, turn their backs on you, try to harm you for the gospel's sake. I'm not here to preach an easy gospel. I'm here to preach a life-changing, a live gospel that comes from the very book I hold in my hand. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of fluffy messages going around that tell you if you... If you say a prayer, a magical verse and word, then all of a sudden your life gets better and, and your best life now. But people who believe they have their best life now haven't read about heaven. This is not my best life. My best life is the one to come. There is no crown without a cross. There is no easy route walking with Jesus Christ. Notice who's mentioned, Jesus and Noah. Like Jesus, like Noah. They have a lot in common. First thing I see in the text that I want you to take home, we walk the path of Noah. We walk the path of Jesus. He is our example that we follow. Let me share a verse with you. Chapter 2, same book, verse 21. For this you were called, because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Who was reviled and did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously. That's our example. What's that mean? We will be slandered. Don't slander back. We will suffer. Do not threaten. Commit yourself to the judge of all the earth and be faithful to God. That's the example that we have in Christ. We walk the path of Noah. We walk the path of Jesus. One of the biggest tricks of the devil is to convince you that there is, no, there, is no, there is no suffering, that you can have the crown 
without the cross, that there is an easy route to Christianity. If you remember the tempting of Jesus in the wilderness, how many remember that? Matthew chapter 4, Luke gives an account. Jesus Christ, he's about to make a big decision. He's going to pick his apostles, those who represent him. He's going to give them authority to do things that only apostles could do. Jesus goes into the wilderness to be tempted, led by who? The Spirit of God. And he goes into the wilderness, and when he is hungry and thirsty, close to his commitment fast, the devil himself comes. I believe the devil came as an angel of light. I don't believe the devil came. He was trying to hide himself, who he was. The devil is not a, 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 a being with a pitchfork breathing fire. The devil is beautiful. He's an angel, a fallen angel. He, he, he's not what the world portrays him to be. So the devil comes and he begins to do what? He begins to share scripture. The word of God, on the word of God. But what's he do to the scripture? He twists it. He changes it. He tries to get Jesus to sin. He does what he always does. Did God surely say? That's exactly what he did to Adam and Eve. Oldest trick in the book. And so the devil, the, 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 the deceiver, he tries to get Jesus to take an easy route. Look what it says, Matthew 4, 9. I'm not trying to keep you till 9 o'clock, so I'm going to try to buzz through this thing. And he said to him, who's he, the devil? Who's him, the Jesus? All these things I give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it's written. You shall worship the Lord your God, and only him shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to Jesus. Why, how does that fit in the point I'm making? Because the devil said here, it is. Don't go to Calvary. Here it is. Don't suffer for their sins. Here it is. Avoid the cross. Here it is. I'll give you everything you want. All you got to do is bow down and worship me. There are many of you listening to the sound of my voice that God can use and will use to shake the gates of hell if you will not bow down and fall for the temptation that there is an easy route to Christianity. Whatever it is that you will fail in, whatever it is that the devil can give you tonight to walk away from your commitment to God, whether it's a relationship, whether it's money, whether it's a bag of dope on the ground, whether it's a, a, a better job that keeps you from church on Sunday, whatever it is, he will give it to you. Can I tell you, friend, stay committed to Jesus Christ no matter how hard the route gets. Stay faithful to God, Freeway Ministries. Stay faithful. You say, I'm going through a hard time. What did Jesus go through for you? Verse 18 says what he went through. For Christ also suffered once for sins. The just for the unjust. That he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. You're saved if you're a Christian tonight. You're saved because Christ suffered for you. He was beaten for you. He was rejected, lied on, slandered, humiliated, and killed for you. For what? Doing the right thing. He was unjustly tried and lied on. His motivation was not popularity. His motivation was not being appreciated by people. His motivation was not being safe and comfortable. His motivation was submitting to the will of the Father no matter what it cost. That's the path of Jesus. That's the path of Noah. The church that Peter was writing to and the church today has a lot in common with Noah. Noah was a witness for God in a hostile culture who held on to hope and looked to what? Things not 
yet seen. Things not, what's the theme of Peter? Being so focused on the hope to come. Things not yet seen. Who, who can we think of better than Noah to say that? That's, that's the same thing Noah did. Can you imagine what Noah went through? He had a promise from God. It's going to rain. I'm going to have you build a boat. What's a boat? What's rain? The dew came up from the ground, the Bible says. Noah had to have faith. He had to believe God. And so what did Noah do? He had the blueprints. God gave him instruction straight off the press of heaven. This is exactly how you build the boat. This is exactly how you follow my instructions. This is the measurements you need to take. Don't go one inch too far. Don't go one inch too short. This is what you do, Noah. Noah preached judgment was on its way. No one believed Noah. Noah was mocked. Noah was ridiculed. But Noah kept on building anyway. <laughs> I can see Noah with a hammer, hammering the wood, hammering the wood, hammering the wood. And there's people over here saying, you're a fool, Noah. Come on off that ladder and have a drink tonight. You're a fool, Noah. Come on down to the dope house. That ain't no real. What are you doing? That them blueprints don't mean nothing. But Noah and the minority of the other seven people in his family kept on building kept on trusting God, kept on believing the impossible. Listen to me, friend. God has given you the blueprints in the Bible, the Word of God. Thanks. Listen, textbooks don't change people like me, programs, seminars, penitentiaries, jail cells. But when I found the blueprints, I'm going to get happy. Jesus Christ saved me, delivered me, and now my family is rescued from judgment. Now, I'm rescued from judgment. Amen. you got to keep on building, Noah. you got to keep on believing, Noah. You can't come off the ladder, Noah. No matter what people say, no matter what they do, those of us who know Christ walk the path that Noah walked. We have the plan. Christians are called to go the same route. We have the blueprints for salvation. We look towards the promise of what's coming. We also look towards the judgment that's coming, even though we live in a hostile world. Christian, why are you so surprised when people don't like you? Christian, why are you so surprised when people persecute you for doing the right thing? Don't be surprised. Expect it. <laughs> Expect it. Lost people act like lost people. Jesus promised this would happen. Hebrews 7, excuse me, Hebrews 11, 7. You can remember that, can't you? 11, 7. 7, 11 in reverse. By faith, Noah, being warned concerning events unseen, in reverent fear of God, constructed an ark. For the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness that comes by faith. Please hear me out. Those who trusted in Christ have been saved from judgment just like Noah. We are called to take the same path Noah took and Jesus took. Troubles are temporary. You don't have to be afraid because Christ is resurrected and raised and is now seated at the right hand of God above all principalities, all powers, all authorities, every enemy you have, every government official, every parole officer, every drug dealer, every crooked cop, everyone who persecutes you. He is risen from the grave and we are identified with him tonight. That's exciting. We have nothing to be afraid of. We win. We're rescued from judgment. And we preach the same message that Noah and Jesus preached. 2 Peter 2, 5, listen to this verse. And he did not spare the ancient world, 
but preserved Noah, a preacher. <laughs> a pre what sermon did he preach? Three three word sermon. It's gonna rain. He was a preacher. He didn't have the Bible, but he preached. He preached what he knew. A preacher of righteousness with seven others. He brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly. What do I see when I look at Noah? What do I see when I look at that judgment? I see grace. I see the grace of God. I see that God gave this wicked generation time. Time to repent. I see that God was patient with these people for 80 years or more. While Noah preached and they built that ark, God held back his wrath. But they rejected the message and they stiff-armed God and they stiff-armed God. Look what it says in verse 20. Don't believe me, believe the Bible. Who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited. He gave them grace. Grace. If you read Genesis 6, you'll read about these people. It says their minds were continually on evil all the time. And God in his undeserved, un, un, unmeriting grace that you cannot earn held back his wrath on these evil people and gave them time to trust the message and come on his way of salvation. Tonight, I don't know where you are, but I'm telling you right now, you don't have to have a needle in your arm. You don't have to have a criminal record. You don't have to be uh, running from the police to be evil. You can be a church member sitting on a church pew. The Bible says in Romans 3 that there is none righteous, no, not one. The cross is level ground. Nobody in this room is better than nobody in this room. We're all equal, born in sin. The message is open tonight. The cross is open tonight. You can be saved from sin. You can be rescued from your sin if you'll trust in Jesus Christ, man. I'm going to get excited by myself. I don't need nobody to get excited with me, Brother Jeff. The, the way is open. We preach a message of salvation just like them. People say the spirits in prison in verse 19 are angels. I don't believe they're angels. Because God in the Bible never says he's patient with angels. He was patient with them. He's patient with one thing on this earth. Sinners. The waves obey him. The ocean, the wind, nature worships him. But we disobey him. But he is patient and he is gracious. He is loving, he is kind. He poured out his wrath on Jesus Christ for you, friend. All you have to do tonight is repent of your sins and trust in the sacrifice that was made for you. Not because you're good, not because you said a prayer, not because you get money. Don't wait to get cleaned up. Don't wait to go home and straighten things out. Don't wait to get out of that relationship first. Don't wait until you get a little of that alcohol out of your system. Make tonight the night where you trust in Jesus Christ while the ark is open and salvation is at hand. The Bible never says tomorrow is the day of salvation. The Bible says today is the day. Right now is the time you can be saved from your sins if you'll trust in Christ. You say, preacher, I don't want to hear that. Well, you came to the wrong place. <laughs> it's not my job to make you respond. It's my job to preach the gospel. I'm going to preach the gospel if I don't care if I get one hand clap. I don't care if I get one amen. I don't care if you throw a chair at me tonight. I'm preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ because that's my job. And what a privilege, what an honor to walk the path of Noah tonight and preach the gospel to an undeserving people. People like me. How do you think Noah felt? I tell you stories. I can tell you stories about my wife. I do it all the time. She loves it. <laughs> she doesn't love it. 
She puts up with me. She's a good woman. I remember one day my wife was pulled over in the driveway, going to the woman's house to handle discipline issues. And I could look in her eyes and I knew she was discouraged. I waved at her like this. I told her, stop the car. She stopped the car. I opened the door and it was like she crumbled out of the door into my arms and weeping in tears. She said, I feel so deceived. I feel so manipulated. I feel like I have no discernment. Because we caught somebody in a lie. We caught them doing stuff that got them kicked out. We had to put them out of the house. And I told my wife, I said, listen, are you telling me that you think you can't be fooled? I can't see your heart. Charlotte can't see your heart. But God can. It's not my job to convince you that God is alive and you can be saved from your sins. It's my job to take the sword of the Holy Spirit and send it out into the crowd, hoping that you repent, that your heart is right, and that God would save you from your sins. Think of Noah. Noah, he's on the ark. God says, come, come on the ark. Noah leads his family. He leads his animal. That last snail is stepping towards the ark, man. He's taking forever. He gets, he gets on the ark, and the Bible says that God shut the door. Now, you imagine you're Noah for a moment. The rain comes. People say, well, the world was judged by rain. The waters of the deep broke. How did they know thousands of years ago that there was more water under the earth than above the earth? The water of the deep broke. Noah could hear his neighbor screaming and begging for mercy. Noah was stuck in the ark, safe in God's uh, salvation. But he, you know he thought about all those people who would not listen to him or receive the message. I guarantee he felt like his ministry was a failure. In my personal opinion, nobody ever believed him. But his ministry was not a failure. His ministry was a success. Listen, don't judge your ministry and your witness by the world's standard. Judge your ministry and your witness by being obedient and doing what the Word of God says to do. Be a witness. Share Christ. Stand bold for God. But don't let people not believing you affect you. Trust God. Do what God says do. And if they don't believe you, that's between them and God. You're not the Holy Spirit. You are a lousy Holy Spirit, by the way. You can't save people, call people, draw people, convict people, make people believe the gospel. That's not your responsibility. That's God's responsibility. Here's your take home. Preach. Warn. Serve God. Rebuke, uh, rebuke false teachers. Take heed. People will mock you, make fun of you, laugh in your face. But don't get discouraged because you're doing what God has called you to do. No matter what is going on around you, Christian, you're called to be obedient regardless of your circumstance. Ministry, success, regardless of that, regardless of popularity, regardless of difficulties, what God sees as successful ministry and what we see as successful ministry is two different things. That was for somebody. It might have been for me. And the last thing I'll say is this. We've got two choices tonight. Salvation or judgment. Salvation or judgment. Man, I can't imagine being on that boat. The Bible says God shut the door. Noah didn't shut that door. It's not his door. Jesus said, I am the door. God shut it. He's in control of salvation. Judgment's going on. Verse 19, said, Jesus says that it, Jesus preached to the spirits in prison. Those who were judged by the flood, 
God was patient with them. How did Jesus preach to the spirits in prison in those days? Jesus preaches through people, just like Jesus is preaching through me. We are the body of Christ. We are the hands and feet. This is not my message. This is not the message of freeway. This is not the message of the Baptist. This is not the message of the Pentecostal. This is the message of the word of God, Jesus Christ preaching. Jesus preached then through Noah. Jesus is preaching right now through the Holy Spirit, through your preacher. Just like the days of Noah, Jesus Christ spoke through people. He's looking for those who are willing to preach salvation. He's looking for those who are willing to preach judgment. Just like Peter's day in the church today, we are called into this. Friend, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, with a message like this, right now will you repent Right now, will you trust in Jesus Christ and be saved from your sins? Or will you be like Noah and continue on with your life, mocking God, shaking your fist in his face, waiting for another day to trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior? You say, preacher, how can you liken it to Noah's day? I don't understand. Luke 17, 24, let Jesus do the preaching. Luke 17, 24. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things <laughs> and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in, in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking and buying and selling and planting and building. But on that day, when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Ignore him, reject him, mock him, make fun of him, continue planting, continue building, continue marrying and giving in marriage, continue mocking the preacher of Jesus Christ, but one day it will be too late. Hebrews 9 says this, it's appointed for man once to die and then comes the judgment. I love you. I care about you. I love you so much, I have to preach this kind of a message to you tonight. I want to see you come to Christ. I want to see you trust in Jesus. I want to see you in heaven with me, kicking up goat dust, walking down the streets of gold, worshiping and enjoying God for all eternity. I do not want to see you be separated to a place of judgment. There are not three groups of people in this room. There are two groups of people in this room. It's not the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots, the addicts and the not not and those who aren't addicts. It's the sheep and the goats. It's the sons of obedience and the sons of disobedience. It's the saved and the lost. It's the judged and the saved. Just like it was in Noah's day. And I want to encourage the believer in Jesus Christ before I close. You can't lose. You can't lose. Quit being so discouraged. You're a victor. You're seated at the right hand of God. Say to yourself, I am a child of God. I cannot lose. I have to win because Jesus has won. You're far above your enemies, friends. God is sovereign. He is in control. I remember one day, I used to live at 1300 West Nichols Street. First house me and Keith got, my boy. He was two and a half years old. I lived on the corner of Nichols and Fort, right by the railroad tracks in the bridge. First thing I did when I got out of prison is 
After I got, after I got out of the Salvation Army Harbor House, I went and got that little house for me and Keith. And uh, they said, you're living in the hood. I said, I love it over here, man. They, they stole the storm windows off my house while I was asleep, and I didn't even know it. I remember I was walking to Salvation Army to get a, get a meal at noon, and, and, and I was walking over there to see my friends. Jim Snell used to run that. He's a dear friend of mine, and I went over there to see Jim Snell. And as I was walking down uh, Grant, I looked over, and there's this little girl playing on the porch, and there was all these people everywhere. And that little girl did a face plant. Do you know what a face plant is? It's when you fall with your hands behind your back and your face catches the whole body. You know what I'm talking about? That's what happened. Face plant. I mean, it was rough. It made me stop and look. And, and, and all these people were on the porch. And they all had their hands out for this little girl. And the little girl cried. She was in shock, you know, holding her breath. You know, how, you know what I mean? She wasn't going to breathe. She just held it, crying. She was trying to cry. She couldn't cry. Her face hurt. And she jumped up, and all these people had their hands out. You know what she did? She stopped, and she looked. And she looked, and she looked, and she looked, and she found the arms of her father. She ran past everybody else. And she jumped into the arms of the person she trusted most. Tonight I'm here representing the person I trust the most. Jesus Christ. The arms of the Father. I'm seated at the right hand of God in a position high above all persecution, above all my enemies above every mockery, every laugh, every, everything that can, can happen. The Bible says that there's a type that's a type of judgment. Verse 21, baptism. The whole world was baptized in water. When Jesus went down into the water by John, he was baptized. When Jonah went down in the water, he was baptized. Jesus used those things as an anti-type to show that he would be buried in the grave, and he would rise again. Romans 6, 4 says that we, by faith, have been baptized in him. My position in Christ is my baptism. The day I got saved, I became a child of God, not because I got water baptized, not the removal of the flesh, the dirt from the flesh, Romans 20, or chapter, chapter 3, verse 21, not water but, but a conscience, the answer of a conscience, good conscience towards God. I have a good conscience towards God tonight because I'm saved. That's my baptism. I'm identifying with Jesus Christ. I got a nephew here and I got another nephew. And, and my brother kind of raised this, you know, he's a father to me. And, and he used to tell us if one comes home with a black eye, you all come home with a black eye. That was good parenting. <laughs> Not really. One of you runs, you all run. One of you fights, you all fight. What happens to David better happen to Keith, better happen to John. Or I'm a, when when one, comes, one comes home with a black eye and the other two don't have one, I'm giving you both a black eye when you get home. <laughs> I'm not joking. Why? We identified with each other. What happened to one of us happened to all of us. That's salvation. Jesus was judged already for you. He took your penalty on the cross. God poured out his wrath on Jesus for you. All you have to do is forsake your sin. And trust in him tonight. Listen, come have a funeral for your life. Come be buried. Put yourself on the cross. I don't remember my whole prayer when I got saved, but I remember very clearly. I said, I give you my life. Use me like the drugs used me. <laughs> 
give me a purpose. Surrender my life to Jesus Christ, and I've never been the same. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Walking the path of Jesus, walking the path of Noah. Listen with your heart. Romans 6, 4. We were buried, therefore, with Jesus by baptism unto death, in order that, the, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in a newness of life. For we have been united with him in a death like his. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we should no longer be slaves of sin.